en la comunidad de escuelas y salud pública del condado de Marin. Este webinar se transmite simultáneamente en español. Haga clic en el botón de interpretación del idioma que aparece en su pantalla si desea escuchar esto en español. Muchas gracias a Marta Dichon, que es nuestra intérprete esta tarde. Great, thank you so much, Michelle. Just wanted to uh, let all of you know that while we have received some questions in advance, if you do have any, uh, please be sure to put them in the chat. We'll try to make sure they all get answered. So tonight is quite symbolic um, as we come full circle. So here we are in person at the Marin County Office of Education. It's been 428 days since this exact panel was together on March 9th, 2020. And that was the first COVID-19 community meeting. Um, at this point, uh, I just wanna say that we are so happy to be together in person and very happy to have you join us. I wanna give a quick update for our schools. First, um, you may not know that the US Department of Education has highlighted the work in Marin County um, so that people across the country can get a sense of what happened here in order to ensure that our students could get back to school in person. And I guess we all know what happened here. We worked together, we stayed focused, and I mean laser focused on what was best for kids, uh, worked so closely with our partners. I will be forever grateful, as will the parents in our community, for the amazing team at the Marin Public Health, Dr. Willis and Dr. Santora, and in addition, the support that we received from others um, in our community, especially Kaiser Permanente, and so happy that Dr. Marva is with us as well. So as I stand here today, I can tell you that Marin County has had 2 million 219,000 student days. Um, those days have been amazing for our students, uh, but what they have also shown is that if we follow the protocols, if we listen to public health, if we follow the science, that what we can report to you is that after those over 2 million days, we've had only uh, 12 suspected in-person, 12, excuse me, 12 suspected um, COVID positive cases that could have been transmitted at school. And none of those cases actually involved a student to an adult. As of today, 100% of Marin schools are offering in-person opportunities for students. 92% um, of our schools are open five days per week. Uh, so where we are is exactly where we wanna be. We're in a situation where we are ready to make sure that that next layer um, vaccination is available to all. As you're aware, our school staff has had the opportunity to receive vaccinations on many, many occasions, starting back in January. In addition, our students 16 to um, 18 year olds are now at least 77% have had at least a one vaccination. And so we are now excited to learn this evening and to answer your questions about our next steps related to our students that are 12 to 15. So to all of you, thank you so much, especially to all the educators and partners in our community who have uh, made returning to school a, a reality. So at this point, I'm happy to pass this mic to Dr. Shilpa Varva, who's going to um, give us some information related to, um, from her perspective, she's a Kaiser doctor, um, infectious disease is her um, focus, and she'll be talking about vaccine, vaccine safety, efficacy, and the results of the studies that are available for students that are um, age 12 and above. So here you go to the mic.
Can you confirm you can see me and my slides? I guess this is what the new model looks like. We are here in person, but also trying to get on the Zoom. <laughs> All right. So thank you, Mary Jane, for the kind introduction and for inviting me back here again. I am an infectious disease clinician, so infection prevention is an area near and dear to my heart. Vaccines play an important role in disease prevention, and I'm so excited to be presenting an overview of the COVID-19 vaccines at a time when we are getting ready to vaccinate our 12 to 15-year-old children. So COVID-19 vaccines are an important tool which will help us get back to the new normal. The vaccines are both safe and effective, and currently there are three vaccine products that are available and authorized for use in the United States. These include the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, as well as the Johnson & Johnson & Janssen product. So the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is the only vaccine that is a single dose for those aged 18 and older. In contrast, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine are both mRNA vaccines, and they involve two shots given three to four weeks apart. The youngest age for which the vaccine was approved was 16 for the Pfizer vaccine, but that changed yesterday. So as of yesterday, the FDA has authorized the use of the Pfizer vaccine for children between the ages of 12 to 15. The Pfizer vaccine now becomes the first vaccine available to adolescents, not just here in the United States, but all over the world. And uh, Pfizer had applied for an emergency use authorization to the FDA to expand its vaccine to adolescents based on clinical trial data that they released back in March 2021. I will be talking about the data in a little bit. The next step in the process uh, involves a meeting of the CDC's Vaccine Advisory Panel, ACIP, which is expected to meet tomorrow and review the clinical trial data and make recommendations for the vaccine's use in adolescents. It is also worth noting that the Moderna trial for the 12 to 17 year olds is ongoing and results of those are expected soon as well. So I'm just trying to advance my slide here. Now, as there is renewed interest and excitement um, surrounding the COVID-19 vaccines, I go back to the two fundamental questions that every parent, every caregiver, every physician, and frankly, every individual wants answers to. Are the COVID-19 vaccines safe? And do the COVID-19 vaccines work? Are they effective? The answer to those, both those questions is yes and yes. And before I delve into vaccine efficacy and safety, I would like to take a few minutes to discuss mRNA vaccines in general, because it might help clarify a few issues. So mRNA stands for messenger RNA. mRNA vaccines introduce instructions into our body, not the virus or viral particles, just instructions. Once the vaccine is given, mRNA teaches our cells to make and display the spike protein. The cell then displays this harmless spike protein that our body recognizes is foreign, and our body creates antibodies against it. The cell then breaks down the instructions and mRNA is eliminated by our cells. This mRNA never gets incorporated into our DNA because it never enters the nucleus, which is where DNA is stored. So again, while mRNA vaccines may be new, the technology has been used and studied by researchers for decades. The mRNA vaccines are held to rigorous efficacy and safety standards by the FDA. They cannot give someone COVID-19 because mRNA vaccines do not use the live virus or any component of the virus for that matter that causes COVID-19. They do not affect or interact with our DNA in any way because the mRNA never enters the nucleus of the cell, which is where the DNA resides. The cell breaks down and gets rid of the mRNA as soon as it's finished using instructions. Um, I was reviewing this with my son, who explained that this is kind of like how Snapchat works, message disappearing after it's read. So that's the analogy there. 
So what do we know about vaccine effectiveness? We know that all COVID-19 vaccines currently available in the United States are effective at preventing COVID-19 as seen in the clinical trial settings. We've seen the data, you probably have all read the 95% efficacy rate that has been widely reported in the media. But what's heartening to infectious disease clinicians and you know, everybody who's looking at the data is the fact that we continue to see evidence that the mRNA vaccines offer similar protection under real world conditions. We also know that some people who are fully vaccinated against COVID-19 will, will still get sick because no vaccine is 100% effective. We continue to monitor these breakthrough cases and evaluate how often this occurs, how severe the illness is, and how likely a vaccinated person is to spread COVID-19 to others. These are some questions to which we are still learning the answers. Again, very heartening that we continue to see data about mRNA vaccine performance in the real world coming out of both the United States as well as places like uh, Israel and Qatar. So this brings me to the Pfizer adolescent clinical trial data that has been released so far. The clinical trial enrolled 2,260 adolescents between the ages of 12 and 15. They were roughly divided into half. So 1,131 children received two doses of the vaccine three, three weeks apart. This is the same dose and the same vaccine that is used currently for those aged 16 and older. 1,129 children received a saltwater placebo. And then researchers studied and followed these children. And what they found was that there were 80 cases of symptomatic coronavirus infection in the placebo group and none. I repeat, zero cases among children who received the vaccine. This obviously is really, really good news. So if uh, the adult data gets an A+, plus, based on this trial, we are giving this an A++. Plus plus. The vaccine um, is well tolerated with side effects that are consistent to those that have been observed in participants 16 to 25 years of age. And this is a good segue for me to talk about vaccine safety. COVID-19 vaccines were evaluated in thousands of participants in clinical trials. The vaccines meet the FDA's rigorous scientific standards for safety, effectiveness, and manufacturing quality needed to support an emergency use authorization. And since the vaccines have been approved, millions of people in the United States have received COVID-19 vaccines. Um, the first vaccine was rolled out back in December. Results from ongoing vaccine safety uh, vaccine safety monitoring efforts are reassuring. So um, what do we know about vaccine side effects? We know that vaccine side effects can vary. Some people may have no side effects at all. You know, I reassure these people that the vaccine is still effective and working. Other people have reported common side effects like swelling, redness, and pain at the injection site, fever, headache, tiredness, muscle aches and pains, chills and nausea. The good news is these symptoms tend to be short, uh, they tend to be short limited. <clears throat> COVID-19 vaccines are considered to be reactogenic. So this means that side effects are not unexpected. And uh, like I mentioned, the side effects tend to be short lived. To date, we have systems in place to monitor the safety of these vaccines and they have only found two types of serious side effects after vaccination both of which are extremely rare. These include anaphylaxis, which can occur with any vaccine, and they include the thrombocytopenia syndrome associated with thrombosis or the clotting disorder, which was reported specifically with the Johnson Johnson or Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. I think I may be missing a slide here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about allergies and anaphylaxis. So severe allergic reactions to COVID-19 vaccine are very rare, but they can occur. An allergic reaction is considered to be severe when a person needs to be treated with epinephrine or the EpiPen, or they must go to the hospital. Anaphylaxis is a type of severe allergic reaction. If someone develops an immediate allergic reaction, and by immediate, we mean within four hours of receiving the vaccine, uh, they should not get a second shot without first discussing with their doctor. Another question that often comes up is what about people who have allergies? So people with severe allergies to either oral medications, food, pets, insect stings, latex, or even environmental irritants like pollen or dust,
can get the COVID-19 vaccine. But of course, we always recommend talking to your personal physician because all pediatricians, family doctors, and personal physicians are well versed in having these individualized um, conversations with you. I also want to talk briefly about this phenomenon called COVID arm. Some people experience a red, itchy, swollen, or painful rash where at the location of where they got the shot. This can occur a few days to more than a week after the uh, first dose, and it can sometimes be quite large. I mentioned this because if someone gets a COVID arm after the first dose, they can and should get the second dose of uh, the vaccine at the recommended interval. This is not a contraindication to getting the vaccine. Many people have questions about long-term safety. So serious side effects that can cause long-term health problems are extremely unlikely following any vaccination, including COVID-19 vaccines. This is because vaccine monitoring has historically shown us that vaccine side effects generally happen within six weeks of receiving a vaccine dose. It is for this reason that the FDA required each of the authorized COVID-19 vaccines to be studied for at least eight weeks after the final dose. Millions of people have now received the COVID-19 vaccines and no long-term side effects have been detected. These people are all considered to be enrolled in the phase four of the trial, which basically means there is going to be ongoing monitoring and surveillance that keeps happening. So while we have learned many things about the pandemic, about the virus, about the COVID-19 vaccine, we continue to seek answers to some questions uh, that we do not have full clarity on. So what are some of the questions that we are still learning about the COVID-19 vaccines? When we are learning how well do the vaccines protect you from spreading the virus that causes COVID-19 to others, even if you yourself are asymptomatic. The early data is reassuring and shows that vaccines may help keep people from spreading COVID-19, but we continue to learn more as more people get vaccinated. We are also learning how well the vaccines protect people who have a weakened immune system, either because of disease or because they are on immunosuppressant medications. We also continue to learn how long does the vaccine protect people? Is there going to be a requirement in the future uh, for a booster shot? We do not have that answer yet. How many people have to be vaccinated against COVID-19 for most people to be considered protected within the community? So what is the population immunity level? Uh, we continue to learn more about this. And then finally, how effective are the vaccines against some of the new variants of the virus that we continue to see across the world and also here within the US? We know that the vaccines work against some variants and we continue to learn more about the new variants. So this sort of, you know, brings me back home to what are really the benefits of getting the vaccine? But the benefits are simple. The COVID-19 vaccines are effective at keeping people from getting COVID-19. And if you are fully vaccinated, the CDC recently put out guidance on some of the things that you can now start doing, which you may have stopped doing because of the pandemic. This includes gathering indoors with fully vaccinated people without wearing a mask or staying six feet apart. This includes you know, gatherings or activities outdoors without wearing a mask, except in certain crowded settings and venues, and travel within the US without getting tested or having to quarantine if you are fully vaccinated. The fact that we are meeting and doing this town hall in person um, is a testament to the benefits of the vaccine. So this pretty much brings me to the summary slide. Um, this is an exciting phase of the pandemic because we now finally have the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine uh, approved for our children aged 12 and older. Reminder that the Pfizer vaccine is given as two doses, 21 days apart. The dose is the same as that has been used for those 16 and older. A person is considered fully vaccinated two weeks after getting their second shot, and the vaccine is effective and safe and will bring us to the end of the pandemic. And with that, I thank you for your time and attention. I am going to turn the podium over to Dr. Matt Willis. Thank you, Dr. Marwa. Good evening, everyone. Matt Willis, Public Health Officer from Wright County. Um, it's remarkable to be, to be here tonight. Um, in the same space, I have to say the space looks a lot different now than it did last year or 14 months ago when we had our convening. It occurs to me that that was 
one of the last times we had a gathering together, one of the last times I saw Shilpa in person. Um, and now as we come to the, hopefully the arc at the other end of this, um, it's, it's, that was, you know, this is the, one of the first times now we're able to start, start gathering. Um, and we hope this is something that we'll continue to be able to do. And vaccines are probably the primary um, and singular most important tool for us to continue our progress. I'm also just want to uh, call attention to what, what's behind me, which is gloves and face coverings, hand sanitizers, HEPA air filters, face shields, N95 masks, testing supplies. This is the war room now. This, this, this space has been converted into the war room around all of the work at MCOE that has been so successful in trying to get our schools back open. This is a picture of um, Lucio Gonzalez. Lucio was um, known to many of us because he was our first case of COVID-19 um, in Marin County. He was uh, a passenger on the, the Diamond, was it the Diamond Princess? Grand, Grand Princess. Princess cruise ship, um, where there was famously the, the first real well-described outbreak of COVID-19 when we first learned just how infectious this was in that kind of setting. Um, Lucia was also our first death in Marin County. And so as we go through um, the numbers um, and describing the arc of this you know, pandemic experience, remembering that every number we share corresponds to a person, um, a mother, a father, a son, um, a grandfather. And this is Lucio with his, with his granddaughter. And these are the numbers. Uh, almost 12,000 cases so far since the start of the pandemic in Marin County. Right now there's uh, 117, I think today that number is down to 102. Active cases, 182 deaths. Um, remarkably, we have had, had not had a death in the last three weeks in Marin County, which is one of the longest intervals without a death that we've had. Um, and that's also, and I'll talk more about this later, largely related to the vaccination rates among our most vulnerable oldest residents. Um, we've had almost 500,000 tests performed um, and have vaccinated um, 177 or 178,000 residents. This is our vaccine progress as a county. Um, this is information is available on our website. Um, this is something I like to look at each day to feel encouraged about our progress. Um, 80, almost 87% of our residents have been vaccinated with at least one dose, 71% with two doses. Um, and we are, uh, you know, one of our, one of our hopes um, is that as we expand access to our 12 to 15 year olds, we'll be able to maintain this, this pace and this progress. Um, this breaks down by age group. Um, our older residents, our age 65 plus, have really set the bar very high for us. 97% of our residents age 65 plus had at least one dose. Um, most are now fully protected, which uh, is, is uh, echoed by the, the fact that we have not seen any deaths in the last three weeks in Red County and 92% of our deaths were among our residents age 65 plus. Um, so for us younger residents, we, we, have to, we have a lot of work to do to catch up to our oldest residents. We also know that the vaccine hesitancy tends to be less prevalent in older, in older residents. And that's because they have more lived experience from their own lives of, of the harm of vaccine preventable diseases. Many of our older residents who came to our vaccination sites were telling stories of how it reminded them of days when, when polio vaccines were, 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 were shared in you know, the early 1960s, lining up to get uh, protected from polio. Um, and so we have, we have something to learn from our, from our elders there. Um, this how, is how Marin County is faring relative to other counties in our vaccine rollout, shows that we have the, the highest vaccination rates in the state. Um, and this is, again, I think to echo Mary Jane's earlier comments about the power of partnership. This is because we have been able to work together right from the start, even before the vaccine arrived, to really have a plan in place that integrated all of our all of our sectors, our emergency medical services, our fire partners, our volunteers in the Medical Reserve Corps, our hospitals, all three of our hospitals, um, public health, had really come together to design a vaccine distribution plan and strategy that we will implement very effectively 
combined with a community that we are grateful um, recognizes the value of, of science and public health practice um, and has um, and, and have high demand for vaccine. This is just a little glimpse into what I hope is you know, our experience as a community. This is our vac this is the impact of vaccines in our long-term care facilities. So this was when when you know when the first vaccines arrived on December 15th, we immediately you know, had a plan to go out to our long-term care facilities. We visited all 13 of our skilled nursing facilities within the first five days um, to offer the first doses to staff and then went on to residents and then the second doses um, in January and February. And what you see here is a dramatic reduction, just a, a radical drop in the number of cases in our long-term care facilities that followed that very aggressive vaccination campaign in that setting. And it really was attributable to, to the protection conferred by, by the vaccine. And this is a sort of a microcosm of the impact of vaccine in any community. So this is the, that's the good news. I think one, one important caveat as we celebrate the success in vaccinations is that we are still vulnerable. It takes two weeks, as, 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 as Dr. Marwell said, two weeks after the second dose to be really fully immune from a physiologic perspective. We've been moving so quickly with our vaccine distribution plan that we have tens of thousands of residents who have been vaccinated but are not yet immune. So it's an important message that just because you've been vaccinated doesn't mean you can behave as if you're fully immune yet. We have had multiple cases of people that have been infected with COVID-19 after one dose. Um, so this is what this graphic shows is that this, the total, these are all Marin County residents represented in these state figures and about half in the green are fully vaccinated and the other half in the pink are not fully immune, I should say, are not two weeks after that second dose. So there's plenty of room there still for surges and for outbreaks um, if we're not continuing to practice the, the, the non-pharmacologic non measures that we've been advocating all along, social distancing, covering our faces when we're indoors, especially with where uh, uh, unvaccinated people. So really briefly, here's the timing of how we're going to see the rollout of the Pfizer vaccine. Dr. Marama mentioned some of this. So Monday, the FDA offered the emergency use authorization. On Wednesday, tomorrow, we're seeing the CDC, the um, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices is going to meet. Um, tomorrow night, the Western States Scientific Advisory Group is going to meet. So there's another layer of protection for us, another in independent review body to look at the data, make sure it's safe and effective. Then again, on Thursday morning, CDPH, California Public Health, is also going to review that all of the data that comes in thus far and the recommendations that have accumulated to that point and, and offer the final recommendation for us at the local level to go ahead and start getting shots into arms. So we're looking to make appointments made immediately available after the California Department of Public Health makes their recommendation, and that's likely to be Thursday. And Dr. Santora will cover how that, you know, how you'll be able to get appointments for, for your 12 and 15 year olds shortly. So vaccinating Marin students, our, our 16 to 18 year olds came online, you might remember on April 15th, um, less than a month ago. We already have 81% of our 16 to 18 year olds have been vaccinated with at least one dose. There's 9,000 people in that age group. So about 7,000 have been vaccinated. For our 12 to 15 year olds, there are about 14,000 in Martin County. Our goal is to vaccinate at least half um, by the end of next week, by May 21st. Um, and we, keep, we think we can accomplish that goal. We've already done uh, really well with our 16 to 18 year olds. The mechanism is gonna be very similar. You know, parents, essentially parents bringing in their children to get vaccinated in a variety of sites across the county engineered for, for, for convenience and efficiency for you all um, that Dr. Santoro will review. Why vaccinating our 12 to 15 year olds is a priority for us. You know, some have said, what, why, you know, why is this such a high priority? We've been saying that, that you know, 12 to 15 year olds are less susceptible to infection. They're not as likely to get sick. Um, so I just wanna briefly go through both the, the, the individual health as well as the community health value of getting vaccinated. First, as physicians, you know, we, we operate under the Hippocratic Oath, which is first do no harm. So we lean very strongly into what I just outlined in terms of the process, the review process to determine safety and efficacy um, from FDA, CDC, the Western States Advisory Group. Um, we also know, in addition to all that data and the trials, we haven't accumulated now tens of millions of individuals who have been vaccinated so far um, in the United States. 
and can verify the safety and efficacy that the trials already determined. We also um, know that while children are at lower risk, it's true at lower risk for severe illness, lower risk is not zero risk. And about 1% of people in this age group are hospitalized with COVID-19. Um, we also know that as the variants spread right now, we're seeing more and more of the B117, it's about 30% of our cases. We also now just saw um, this past week, three cases of a new variant of concern for us. The variant is emerging out of India, which is um, a so-called double mutant, um, which has the, the, the mutations that are from associated with the California variant for increased infectivity. And then maybe another, another mutation that confers maybe less, um, less strong immune response against that. So that's a concern. We've seen three cases in Marin and, and we're seeing an increased proportion of children among those who are hospitalized in other parts of the country where we're seeing more variants. So that's another reason why, from an individual health standpoint, it's important to get vaccinated. And again, also the long-term effects, long-haul COVID, just because someone uh, doesn't end up being hospitalized or severely ill, doesn't mean they're not gonna have long-term effects from COVID-19 infection. And additionally, the mental, physical, and social health, and I think this is an important point, associated with the freedom to interact the vaccine would offer. So if we recognize that someone who is vaccinated is going to have a lot more freedom to, to move about, to hang out with their friends, to socialize. There's a lot of health wrapped up in that as well that we need to acknowledge. And then unvaccinated status will be an increasing barrier to participation in some activities, as Dr. Marwa mentioned. Events, travel, gatherings are going to be increasingly tied to vaccination status. Um, vaccinating a 12 to 15 year olds is also a priority for our community health. Um, the infectivity is similar to adults for that age for adolescents. Their immune systems is more similar to older, not so true for the younger kids, but for the adolescents, infectivity is similar to adults. So they can infect others. So vaccination will protect family members, grandparents, friends, and classmates. We also know that transmission occurs in gathering. When we look at our, our contact investigations for people in this age group, we're seeing that Transmission among children occurs outside of school. Some of the things they do together, play dates, other gatherings that are occurring, this vaccination will protect them in, the, in those activities. Um, we think it's critical to restore normalcy in both schools and the wider community. Um, we can picture that their entire middle schools and high schools would be protected if 100% of our children age 12 to 15 and 16 to 18 are vaccinated. Um, that's a high school or middle school setting where every child um, in that setting, every adolescent and young adult in that setting is protected as well as the staff. We've had high vaccination rates in staff as well. And that's a total game changer for us in terms of both the safety in the school community and the freedom in terms of the curriculum and other things uh, for, for schools. And then of course, it, community, it, it will contribute to community-wide community. So this is what a school looks like right now. Average high school in Marin County, the same breakdown. Right now about, you know, we have 80% of our age 16 to 18 vaccinated. If you take a school that's, you know, mostly 14 to 18 year olds, this is what it looks like. So it's still vulnerable as a setting. The majority are not, not immune. If, we, if we're able to get the 14, 15 year olds in high school settings now also vaccinated, that's where you have the school where the majority of students could be immune. So it's important for high schools. It's also critical for middle schools because right now this represents the 0% vaccination rate in every middle school in, the, in, in, in Marin County because, because of the age of middle school students. Um, so this is, this is what Mary Jane already offered in terms of the, the protection that, our, that the great work that the schools have done all the way along through just practice. You know, strong protocols, procedures to prevent transmission in schools have been very effective. Um, those have been necessary but are not sustainable for long term. So we're talking about lifting restrictions safely will require vaccinations. So if we wanna actually be more free in our school communities without having to constantly be you know, wearing masks, socially distancing in the schools, managing cohort sizes, et cetera, the ticket to that is through vaccination. So this is our, I'll end with this, is that Marin County has the highest vaccination rates in the state of California. I think we have a shot at community immunity. There are um, a lot of people nationally are start, start pulling back from this idea that we're going to reach herd immunity or community immunity because vaccination rates are topping out at 50%, 60%. We're at 87% among those eligible. 
if we can get you know up to 90%, then 90% of our 12 to 15 year olds, there's only about 10% of the population left between you know, age zero and 11. That would get us to about 80% overall as a community, um, which is close to what the you know what all the infectious disease specialists, epidemiologists cite as that as that level of community immunity that would protect us all against um, any outbreaks. So um, if we're able to be successful in vaccinating our 15 to, our 12 to 15 year olds at the same rates that we've been vaccinating others, we're on track to achieve community immunity and maybe one of the only communities in the United States would be able to achieve that. So now I'll hand it over to Dr. Lisa Santora to talk about how we can find an appointment. And I just wanna acknowledge Lisa, she makes her way to the podium um, for her amazing work. Lisa has wrapped her, her life experiences as a, as a mother and as a physician, as an infectious disease doctor, as a public health specialist um, into a superhero package um, that we have all benefited from, especially in our school community. So thank you, Lisa. Take my mask off. Looking forward to that more in the future. Thank you everyone for being here tonight with us. We're really excited about this opportunity to vaccinate adolescents in our community. There was a time in January where we were looking at adjusted case rates and case rates among adolescents in our community, and we saw them higher than adults. And that delayed the return of some of our schools because of concern around the transmission of COVID-19 by this adolescent group, which is vulnerable. So this is a great opportunity for our community to return all students to school and to return schools back to normal and to move forward and beyond this pandemic. So just grateful to be here. It is historic. Uh, I spoke many times not thinking we'd have to be at this threshold of vaccinating the community for a year. So I'm just really proud of not only the science community for advancing these important technologies to get us to the end of this pandemic in our country, but thankful to our teams. This is Nurses Week, and I'm so thankful to all the nurses from the beginning who have been supporting us in testing and now in vaccination. And uh, that's why we're here today. And again, looking at a very different summer and hopefully a very different school year. So we wanna help you find vaccinations. It's gonna be very easy. It's not how it was in the beginning where vaccines were very, very scarce. We now have sufficient vaccines to vaccinate those 14,000. We know not all 14,000 are going to choose to get vaccinated right away. It is voluntary, it's a choice. And we encourage anyone that has concerns and parents and guardians who have concerns around the vaccine to talk to their healthcare providers. And again, this is, it, it is informed consent that a parent or guardian must provide to a for a child to get vaccinated. So there is choice. That being said, you can learn more on our website, but this is where you can find out if you're ready and your child is ready to get vaccinated. You'll see many of our older adolescents were absolutely ready to get vaccinated, ready to get back to work and ready to get back to school. So really encourage you to have conversations with your adolescents around vaccinations and share the information with them and visit our website, getvaccinatedmarin.org. Um, we make it really easy. Um, you're just gonna click the button on to get a vaccine. And again, don't worry, we have sufficient vaccine supplies for everyone. And this is going to have you find different options. Um, there's going to be a lot of options available starting on the 13th. We have the first option that you'll see is our Larkspark Ferry term, Terminal, very convenient to drive through um, visit. We'll have over a thousand vaccines a day ready um, to start as early as Thursday afternoon and then to restart that vaccination on Sunday. So they operate from Sunday to Thursday. And also you'll be able to see there's different vaccinations offered at different sites. So you'll, you'll be able to pick the site based on getting the Pfizer. So if you are seeking a vaccine for your adolescent, it needs to be the Pfizer vaccine, not Moderna or Johnson & Johnson, Johnson product it needs to be Pfizer. And just going back to our partnerships, I am so grateful we were only able to return to school because of the partnerships that have led the way in testing, led the way in reviewing our guidance, and now are leading the way in vaccinating all in Marin. And so we're just going to review the different partnerships that, again, different opportunities for you to get vaccinated with some of our different partnerships. But we are here because of our partnerships. So the first partnership we have is with the state. The state has created a website called the My Turn website where you can go online and find appointments across the Bay Area. It allows you to select a language. So it's available English, Spanish, Chinese, and many other languages. We want to make sure 
it's accessible for all in Marin. And that's one of the challenges is when there's language barriers. So the state has addressed this by making sure their website is accessible and our amazing public information officer and her team has made sure that our website is accessible for all languages. Our first, um, besides curative um, at the Lark's First Ferry, which we anticipate will be available on Thursday, on Saturday, we're having a very special event. It's in partnership with Safeway, the County Office of Education and Miller Creek School District and the middle school. And we are encouraging students from 12 to 17 years old and their families. And this is really important too. This is not just for the children or adolescents, they're not children anymore, adolescents, it's for families. So we're encouraging Adolescents, students, and their families to sign up for vaccine at the Miller Creek Middle School. We're going to have two large events on May 15th and May 22nd. A parental consent is required, and you can submit that through your online registration. And then um, we're ready to greet you on site. Our team and the Safeway teams will be right there, ready to greet you and help you get vaccinated. I mentioned before, Curative, it's one of our largest sites. It's at the Larkspur Ferry. It's open Sunday through Thursday. We think, again, the first dose will be on Thursday. It all goes according to the sequencing, and it opens at 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. So, we, again, we're trying to find accessible hours, knowing that um, people have work um, and need to work and then be able to take their student to get vaccinated. So this is also one of our more convenient both by location and also by hours. It's the same process. When you go online, you'll be providing parental consent through that online registration, and then you'll be able to show up and get vaccinated that day. And then equity is a key part of our response. We saw in the beginning of this pandemic, the COVID-19 infections drastically affected our Latinx communities in the canal area of San Rafael, but across Marin County. So we've partnered with the Office of Education and school districts across Marin County to identify schools that are serving some of our most vulnerable communities. So our public health teams and our curative um, partnership teams will be deploying to high schools and middle schools across the county. Again, we've partnered with the schools to identify the best time so students can get vaccinated with parental consent, with per permission on site at school. And some schools have opted for a 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. vaccine to support families that can be coming to pick up students in those after work hours. So again, this is inviting all students and their families. We know some people have waited to get vaccinated. So this is a great family opportunity to get vaccinated. So encouraging everyone to bring family members who haven't been vaccinated yet. And then lastly, what we're gonna be seeing is that vaccines are gonna be transitioning from public health back into our healthcare providers. And so we have a great program across the state called Vaccines for Children. These are a list of the healthcare providers who are already registered. Um, they may not be attending this uh, forum right now because they're in a training on how to accept the vaccine and make sure that it's available in its office. And what Marin County Public Health will be doing is serving as a conduit. We'll receive the vaccine. Many of you remember it was a, a trickier vaccine because it's an ultra cold refrigeration that's required. And so we're gonna be supporting providers and dealing with some of the logistics. And then you will be able to get um, your vaccine at your healthcare provider site. So we're excited for this to go online. But it's probably going to take a couple of weeks. So we're encouraging everyone to um, follow our news and visit our website. Um, we are anticipating that announcement on Thursday and that you will be ready to vaccinate. And those sites, those websites will go live and you'll be able to make an appointment as early as, as Thursday morning or Thursday afternoon. But again, we recognize that many people will want to talk to their healthcare provider, which is why we are working to ensure that your healthcare providers also have access to the vaccine so you can talk to them and really make an informed decision around vaccination for your adolescent and for your family. So that's it. And I'm going to jump ahead and we'll be ready to field some questions. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So let me start with a few questions that we received prior um, to uh, this section. Um, and then we'll jump to some of those that uh, Ken Lippy will be reading for us from the chat and through the Q&A. So first of all, uh, when my student uh, receives a vaccination, who should I tell? I'm assuming they should tell their health provider. So when they, I can start with that. So every, every child, every person who's vaccinated, um, the, the, it goes into the California, immunization registry, the care registry. So 
that information will be available to your provider. It will be available to anyone who has access to that registry automatically. Okay, great, great. But um, Dr. Marwell, you would, would Kaiser will have to okay. see. Is there a chance that vaccination will be required for students to return to school next year? I can I can start with that. Um, it's possible. So right now the vaccine is under the emergency youth authorization. It is not um, an FDA approved vaccine the way the measles, mumps, rubella and other vaccines are. There are vaccines that are required for school entry. We have in Marin County about 95% of our, of our children are up to date with their required childhood vaccinations. Um, the question of whether or not the COVID-19 vaccine would be added to that list um, would depend on a F, formal FDA approval and B what the status of the COVID-19 pandemic was at that time and the public health need um, to, to make it a, a policy to require it. When I got my vaccination, I had to wait 15 minutes before I left the site. Will that be true for students receiving their vaccinations? I can take that. Yes. So the 15 minute uh, requirement is to monitor for severe allergic reactions, including anaphylaxis. So we do not expect that to change with children. Once my child is fully vaccinated, do they still need to wear a mask? Yes, it depends on the setting. We're gonna be seeing changes in the state law and recommendations around face coverings. We still have a risk for transmission and this is one of our concerns in the community is that at sporting events right now, if you're attending, even if it's an outdoor sporting event, the athletes on the field and the spectators should all be wearing masks. That's the recommendation from the Center for Disease Control. The recommendation around masking and not wearing a mask is when we're, you're with the, your household and walking in the outdoors. But again, if you remember the slides that Dr. Willis showed about the, the percentage who are fully immune in our community, we're not there yet. So until we achieve that and until we see changes at the state level, which we're anticipating on June 15th, it's still recommended to wear a mask in some specific settings. If you're just visiting two households, you're having a, a private gathering at home and everyone's vaccinated, you can take the mask off. But remember, even your adolescents are not gonna be fully vaccinated. Even if they start that first dose this weekend, they are still not um, fully immune against COVID-19 and there's still a risk of transmitting COVID-19 um, and becoming infected and then transmitting COVID-19. Can I, can I add to that yes, answer? Please. I agree with everything Dr. Santora said. And I, I think that the, um, you know, we should also recognize the benefit of vaccination. If, you know, if we look at Cal OSHA and other regulations, the occupational safety guidelines, um, vaccination status is really the primary branch point for their guidance. So they are signaling that for, for fully vaccinated settings, facial covering indoors and indeed physical distancing may not be as necessary in the future. So this is just in terms of a mental image of what a fully vaccinated setting looks like. You may not need facial covering. You may not need to practice physical distancing. That's the return to normalcy and the freedom that the vaccines promise. In a setting where you don't know and where you'd anticipate there's a mix of vaccinated and unvaccinated persons, everyone is going to have to behave as if everyone that uh, everyone's unvaccinated. So facial covering and physical distancing would be an important part of that setting ongoing, which is one of the reasons we're so you know I think so so invested in in getting vaccination rates as high as they can. And Dr. Marvin, one of the parents wrote that their child was on prednisone. Are they able to receive a vaccination? So I think that's a question that they should discuss with their personal doctor because the devil is always in the details. It really depends on what dose of prednisone for how long are they considered immunocompromised. Uh, that's a discussion, again, part of an informed consent that you would have with your doctor. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of comments that have come over the last um, during this presentation from people that you can tell feel so strongly about not being vaccinated under any circumstances. So many concerns in that space. Um, my question, I guess, is, is there anything um, that we could say, I mean, we're not gonna make anyone get vaccinated, so let's start there. Parents will get to make a choice about the choice for their particular child. So that, that will be, I think, important. And obviously over time, we'll be hoping that more people get more information to make a determination. So I just want to assure these people that are you know, very, very concerned um, at, at some level, you know, 
very challenging about the topic that, that no one will make them get a vaccination or their child, right? Is that accurate? Yes, I think again, this is, um, our approach with vaccines has been informed choice. We have laws in the state of California that do require vaccination, vaccination for school entry. And that, that was what Dr. Willis was alluding to. to. This will be something we closely follow to see if that does change for COVID-19 um, based on emerging research. And honestly, just the behavior of this um, virus in our, in our world. We're very vulnerable right now. We're seeing what's happening globally um, how it's again devastating large populations in India and Brazil. And again, we have this opportunity here in Marin County to follow guidance, to get vaccinated, but it is choice. And we value choice. We appreciate how important it is, especially after a year and a half where there was a lot of restrictions. Uh, and this is, a, this is our pathway out. Um, I was on the front lines of the slide Dr. Willis showed um, at one point, we had over 40 outbreaks in January in our skilled nursing facilities, and people were getting hospitalized and sadly dying. And to see that dramatic impact within weeks of vaccination and that impact is, is very compelling. We, I also see concerns around children. Well, children are not transmitting disease, so why do children need to be vaccinated? We have seen how this disease behaves very differently in that adolescent population, the 12 and above population. There's higher case rates. They can transmit um, they have different behaviors and different um, acceptance of protective behaviors and implementation of protective behaviors. So it remains a reservoir for us. And if it remains under vaccinated, that is the reservoir where variants could arrive into our community. Remember, this um, is a global community. We live um, right next to international airports, and um, that is a concern for us. And so we have an opportunity here, especially with the adolescent population, to pursue that community immunity and to get to the other side of the pandemic. So I would just wanna make note, um, when we first offered the vaccination to the educators in the community, the first sort of grouping was somewhere between 70 and 75% that were you know, interested. And then over a period of time with more information, we're now at somewhere around 93% or higher. And so I think part of this is people sort of socialize to it, figure out where they stand on the, continuum. So I think we can expect probably something like that for parents as they're getting a little more, I think a little more information. Um, Ken, could you help um, here now with any questions that you're seeing? Certainly. Um, will parents have access to information about the children that could have been vaccinated in their, their students' classrooms? And will parents who choose not to have their kids vaccinated ever be required to give a reason, i.e. personal belief, hesitancy, medical exemption? So to the last part of that question, um, if, if it is required, then there will need to be a medical exemption. Would be the only it would be the only allowance. Um, in terms of knowledge, that is an active that is an active um, point of dialogue right now um, to determine what the policies are in terms of of who can be aware of whose vaccination status, whose vaccination status. We're working with our county councils to to determine. Um, who, who is able to actually ask that question? How is that vaccination status verified? Um, you know, our hope is that, that uh, those questions would be answered by the state um, in the next few weeks. There are a number of questions or concerns that this is approved for emergency use only. Could you please talk about what that means compared to full FDA approval? I can take a stab at that. So these are regulatory processes that have been put into place by the FDA. These apply for actually all drugs, therapeutics, and vaccines. Emergency use authorization allows for a drug or a vaccine to be rolled out really quickly when time is of the essence, such as when we are in the middle of a pandemic. The full approval process takes much longer, and Pfizer actually is in the process of applying for a full approval, and we expect that to come through soon. I'm also going to add um, that we are talking about 12 to 15 year olds, uh, but there are already ongoing trials in the younger age group. And again, the expectation is that Pfizer is probably going to apply for an approval or authorization for kids between the ages of uh, two and 12 as early as September. 
because I see that question came up in the chat as well. I know several families and young people who are thinking that they will wait and see how it goes for their 12 to 15 year olds before they get them vaccinated. What would you say to them? I think that is their choice. I think that's what we've seen with all groups. Um, we have early adopters, people who were first in line and we knew in the beginning fighting um, to get um, ahead of the line for vaccination. And then there's people that wanted to see how it was with, with their, their friends, their colleagues and um, delayed the, their vaccination. And so I, what we have seen now, we have a comparable group that's that 16 to 25. And then we have locally the 16 to 17 year olds who have pursued vaccine. We have demonstrated the same safety profile locally that we've seen uh, internationally in studies. And um, that's where we are right now with, with the vaccine. We saw, you know, this is the same pattern with, um, you know, in 2014, 2015, when we had uh, the measles outbreak, pertussis, Marin County had the highest pertussis rates of any county in the state. Um, and there was, you know, there was, I think 75% of our students were, were vaccinated. We're up to 90, 95% now. Um, and it was really a process of dialogue and communication. Um, and it was meeting people where they are, addressing their individual um, concerns, uh, you know, figuring when they're, when they're choosing not to vaccinate, really understand what, what it is they're, they're seeing and perceiving and reacting to, um, and having that one-on-one -on -one conversation. And I think those are conversations that take more time. It, it matches well, I think, our process, because we have efficient mass vaccination operations available for those that are eager and willing to be vaccinated now and, then, and, and acquire the benefit you know, early on. Um, and then those who, who want, want that conversation, our pediatricians will be acquiring the vaccine over the coming weeks and can administer in the clinical settings through dialogue with their patients. And just to add to that, one of the challenges we saw in the past in Marin County is there are children and adolescents who cannot get vaccinated. They're undergoing treatment for cancer or have other immunocompromising um, conditions that prevent them from getting vaccinated. And again, this is where as a community, we work together. So we, we create that cocoon around those individuals who cannot get vaccinated. And that's, that's one of the um, considerations I think we all need to have as we, as we make, make decisions, because there are, there are children and adolescents who will not be able to get vaccinated and who are at higher risk for both COVID-19 infection and for um, poor outcomes due to COVID-19. That relates to a number of questions from folks about um, whether or not their children can be vaccinated if they have um, various medical conditions uh, prone to seizures um, or are in a series of vaccinations for hepatitis B. In all those cases, is the advice always to go to your primary phys care physician? Absolutely. You know, these conversations are individual conversations. Uh, guidelines exist but physicians are well versed in distilling down what those guidelines mean for a patient who is in front of them. So I would encourage you to talk to your personal physician, to talk to your pediatrician. I can briefly talk a little bit about getting other vaccines with the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, you know, we've learned a fair bit because we've been doing this since December. And while there are no contraindications to giving another vaccine with the COVID-19 vaccine, the CDC does encourage separation by a couple of weeks simply because we wanna make sure that any of the side effects are not sort of, uh, we don't muddy the picture. So usually you will only get the COVID-19 vaccine and no other vaccine within two weeks of uh, getting the dose. Yeah, and it's worth noting, I think that the, the contraindications or the reasons not to get vaccinated is a very short list. And many of those medical conditions that people might see as, as reasons not to get vaccinated are in fact reasons to get vaccinated because they make that child more vulnerable if they were to become infected to more serious outcome. I think you bring up such a great point, Dr. Willis. Uh, you know, medically speaking, the only contraindication would be a history of anaphylaxis to one of the components of the vaccine itself. And that includes something called PEG, uh, which is such a rare um, chemical that if you were allergic or had an anaphylactic reaction to it, you would know. Uh, beyond that, there is really no other medical reason to not get the vaccine. This is a, a bit of a statement and a question. It actually sums up several. 
Um, first, thank you for your presentation. You've mentioned that you acknowledge parents are concerned about long-term effects of the vaccine. And you've said that studies have proven that it is okay long-term, yet that term of study was only eight weeks. What about parents who are hesitant and worried about eight months, eight years, 18 years, not eight weeks? How do we know it will be okay long-term when we really don't know the long-term effects yet of COVID itself? I think that goes to what we've seen in past vaccines is when the majority of severe adverse reactions that we see from vaccines are within those first six weeks of vaccination, which is why they extended the study to eight weeks. And we see a lot of myths on Facebook and on the internet around prolonged concerns around fertility and where we, and, and other concerns. And as scientists and physicians, what you look to is um, what is the biology behind those concerns? And so what Dr. Marva described is that this is not the biological plausibility of many of these myths that are being um, shared very widely in the community there is not biological um, plausibility or feasibility for, for these long-term outcomes. What we are concerned though, is, is we have started to see the long-term effects of COVID-19 infection where it is a very strong inflammatory response throughout the system that we will, and it'll take years for us to see what those long-term effects look like after an actual COVID-19 infection. A um, couple of questions about the vaccine process. Is the dose the same size for 12 to 16 as it is for 16 and up? And what kind of identification or proof of age is needed at the vaccination sites? So yes, it's the same, same product, um, same interval, three weeks. Um, the, you know, the vaccine site might look a little different. It's a little more you know, uh, adolescent friendly more, maybe more, more balloons um, and, 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 and nurses who are familiar with helping, helping younger people through the vaccine process a little bit longer per visit. Um, but otherwise the, the, the product and the experience is the same. Um, and what was this, oh, uh, for parent consent? Was that the other part of the- um, How do you know what the culture trial is when they come? Are we making a yeah, so so there's um you know online there's a as you register you you put in your age um, and we we have to make an assumption that people are being honest essentially um, there's um, you know we're not we're we're trying to remove barriers to vaccination um, asking people that you know children don't have the same kind of identification that adults do the driver's license that kind of thing um, adolescents as well. So really the alternative would be a, a birth certificate. Um, expecting all, all people to bring a birth certificate would be just operationally and logistically such a barrier to uh, uh, getting vaccination. Um, and so we are um, relying on self-attestation of, of age. Um, can you please remind us once again, where, what site we can go to, to find out about uh, places we can take our 12 year old and up to get vaccinated and the list of the mobile vaccination sites that could be uh, very beneficial for working families. Where would people go for that information? That's, that's getvaccinatedmarin.org. That's your kind of your one stop. Excellent. Getvaccinatedmarin.org, it's, it's what Dr. Santora shared on her slides. Mary Jane, I think that sums up most of the questions that we've gotten through um, the chat. Okay, are there any other um, comments? I guess I just wanna make note to, um, to those that are here that for our students that have some specialized issues, special needs that need a little bit of a higher touch, we've set up a special opportunity um, here at the County Office of Education on the 18th. So that will have supports there for, for those students. So that's just, I think, another thing that we're looking at. Um, the the um, opportunity to go to Miller Creek Middle School does start this Saturday. So just for people to be aware, I think, to be aware of that. Any other comments before I close? No, I mean, I think we're, you know, we are reaching the, 